You are present in focus. That's traveling to me. It's an urgent need to go and observe this world that we all share. A ray of light, a pair of eyes that tell a story, an instant of perfection. Images printing on your soul. This is authentic beauty. It's all out there, trust me. There's always room for discovery. Call, can you advance? I seem to be locked. Thank you. Again, so um, for those of you um, that are not aware of uh, Silvacia, don't know a lot about us, we are actually one of the Royal Caribbean family of brands. Um, if you think of the pyramid, we're sort of the top of the pyramid. We're the ultra luxury version of um, Royal Caribbean International. And we go to more destinations than anyone else. We go everywhere from the Arctic to the Antarctica, to local as round trip Fort Lauderdale, Caribbean, and basically everywhere else in the world. The best way to describe um, us is basically, if you think you've been there, done that, really take a look at us. Because again, all seven continents and a lot of times very unique itineraries. When I say that, you can be on us in the Mediterranean, let's take example, you can be on four to five back-to-back -back cruises and not repeat a, a port of call. So we have a lot of back-to-back -back guests because we don't repeat a lot of calls. We move, again, the ships are also smaller, which helps. Carl, can you please move on? Thank you. A little bit about our fleet. Um, we have eight ships at, um, excuse me, we have nine ships at present with three more coming online. Um, the Silver Origin and the Silver Moon both came out during the pandemic. Both came out in the last six months. They're all dressed up with no place to go. So with that, you know, so again, two brand new ships, can't wait to go. Um, but our ships are smaller. Our ships range in size um, from 100 guests, which would be the Silver Origin and Galapagos, up to um, 608, which is the Silver Spirit, which is the largest ship we have. Um, we have two ships at 382, and then we have two um, classic vessels at 596 as well. Um, so with that being said, is we can get you closer to where, where you want to be. Like if you take um, a look at this shot, this is a picture of the Silver Whisper at, in, in St. Petersburg at the English Embankment, literally a block away from the Hermitage. And what that means now, all the other ships basically have to dock out of the cruise terminal, which is a beautiful cruise terminal, but it's a schlep to get into town. We dock you in the center of town. And this doesn't only hold true here. Throughout the world, we can, we can do that. And what, when I say that, in Italy, for example, we'll go to Sorrento versus Naples. And if you've ever been to both, you know Sorrento is where you want to be, but all the big ships have to go to Naples. We were, I was on a cruise and it was a Vietnam cruise. Let me just tell you this. If you have never been, that is definitely probably one of the highlight cruises of my like highlight vacations. And I, I'm pretty well traveled, but Vietnam was spectacular, but we were there for three days. We were, th we were in um, Saigon for three days and literally docked right downtown in the center of town. And we, we had a great time exploring it, but I didn't think so much about the location until the last day we were actually um, in one of the um, shops and one of the knockoff shops, I have to admit. And um, we went in and there was a tour group from another cruise line and it was a big, it was a premium line, but a big, big ships and we started talking to them and we said oh we're heading back to the ship now for lunch and we'll come back in town later and they said lunch it took them close to two hours to get there and i said well here the ship is either a five minute shuttle ride or a 
20 minute walk. Again, that's another thing about Silver Sea. We provide shuttles into the center of town in 99% of the places we go. And what that means from you is if you don't want to do a short excursion, you want to do something on your own, explore this, we're going to get you into the center of town so you can do your own thing. Sometimes it might just be to the end of the pier. And when I say that, some piers are very long. Other times it can be a 45 minute bus ride. Call. Cool. This is our newest baby, the Silver Moon. Again, she's all dressed up, ab looking absolutely beautiful. Um, coming, she's hoping to sail. We hope to have her back online in August of this year. But again, all dressed up with no place to go. Go ahead, go on. Some of the public rooms on her, Dolce Vita. But again, the ship only hold, this ship only holds 596. So again, you know, one of, the, one of the things that really makes it special, there's a lot of deck space, there's a lot of extra a lot of extra space on board. To give you an example, a ship this size would normally hold 1,250 guests if she was built as a regular cruise ship. One thing you'll notice when you um, walk down the hallways of the ship, it's one center um, staircase, one cent not center staircase, one center hallway, because there's nothing in the middle. There's no inside cabins. Hallways are nice and wide as well. Another thing we've brought out throughout the fleet on every ship at this point, except for the Silver Whisper and the Expedition ships, is our Arts Cafe, which is open from early morning to late at night, um, where you can always get a cup of coffee, a snack. You can also get an alcoholic beverage. If you wake up at eight o'clock in the morning, want that Bloody Mary and you don't want it from your butler in the room, you can go here and it, it's open. In the evening, again, late night snack you want, but it's always open. Um, it's open basically about 20 hours a day. Go ahead, call. This is a typical suite on Silver Sea. Again, no, there are no cabins on Silver Sea. This is a suite, I believe, on the Silver Muse, which is a sister ship to the Silver Moon, 376 square feet, full marble bathroom, separate tub, separate shower, full walk-in closet as well. But again, this is standard. This is a standard. This is not an upgraded room. It represents about 80% of the ship. And we've come out with salt now on the silver moon. This is a new concept, um, sea, air, land, and taste, where we will have a separate bar, a separate dining room, and a salt lab. And what the, it takes into account of where you are. Very often, you'll find you're on a ship, and let's say you're in the Mediterranean, you're in Greece. When you love Greek food, you're in Greece. Well, this restaurant becomes a Greek restaurant when you're in Greece. You know, three days later, you're in Italy it becomes an Italian restaurant. It also, there's also a bar that's based upon the regions you are. So the specialty drinks, let's say you're in Sorrento, it would be limoncello would be the special. Not that you couldn't get anything you wanted in the bar as well, but again, it's gonna be really featuring local um, beverages, a lot of the local wines from the area and the local specialty drinks as well. And then we have the salt lab where if you want to get involved with doing a little work yourself and putting together things, cooking, you will be able to do that as well. And then we have our newest baby that will be coming out in November of this year. She'll be doing a transatlantic from, um, Europe over to Fort Lauderdale in November, which will be her maiden voyage. And then she'll be doing some Caribbeans followed by a Circle South America cruise as well. We have a little bit about our voyages. We just announced March 22 to May 23, 315 voyages. Our sales, I just have to say this, or record breaking at this point. We've had our best sales ever. It looks like 2022 will basically be sold out by the end of this year. We have many voyages that are sold out. We announced our 2023 world cruise um, in February. We opened it to the general public. We were selling it first to our world cruise guest and then to our Venetian society guest. The day we opened up to the public, it officially sold out. We sold out for a 2023 world cruise. And that's what we're seeing. The long voyages, especially, are selling out much quicker. We are now more all-inclusive than ever. Not only do we include the air, um, business class is only $6.99 per person as well. And as usual, um, gratuities and alcoholic beverages 
and Wi-Fi is included, but now we're including shore excursions. Starting in May of 2022, um, you will have shore excursions included um, with every cruise. They're always included on Expedition, but they will be included as well as on our Classic fleet as well. Grand voyages. Again, I mentioned the World Cruise in 2023, which is so that, but there is a little room on 2022 if you're interested in that. Um, there is a little room on 22, not a lot. I think there's about four or five suites left. And that uh, there are some segments available as well. But we have Grand South America cruises, Grand Mediterranean cruises. And these are becoming more and more popular, um, especially after everything was seen with um, COVID. We're seeing a lot of people not only just interested in travel, but want to be gone a long time. I think it's woken a lot of people up to, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, a lot of people say, let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it next year. Let's do it when. Now everybody's like, I want to do it as soon as I can. And we're seeing that with these grand voyages. A lot of uh, the grand voyages will always have special events on it exclusive to the grand voyage guest. I mean, it's it can be anything from a picnic, but to a night out like in Hong Kong at the Jockey Club in Hong Kong at the racetrack. Really very exclusive events where a lot of the places we take you to on these events, uh, you would not be able to go into otherwise. Again, great places. When I say you wouldn't be able to get into because they're private clubs, private venues as well. And those are always included with the Grand Voyages. This is our World Cruise, January 9th to May 23rd. Again, it is sold out. Um, if you want it, we can get you on a wait list, work with Tammy. Hopefully we can get you cleared. But again, right as of today, it is sold out. Go ahead. Okay, and now I'm going to hand it over to Carl, as he's been the driver of the, and he's, he's, He's sending me, I'm talking too much. He wants to talk now. So I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. So as John pointed out, there are two distinctly different uh, aspects to what we do. There's the classic side of Silver Sea and there's the expedition side of Silver Sea. So I thought we'd talk to you a little bit about expedition and some of the more popular expeditions that we operate. Um, as John said, I'm the director of expedition sales and I love all things adventure and expedition. So if we don't answer your questions or if through the, the course of this presentation, we raise more questions, then please reach out to your travel advisor, call Chami's Journeys and, and uh, let us know. And I'll try to answer your question because I, again, I live for adventure and expedition travel. This, is, this photo was taken in Antarctica in 2002. And Which notice how he has 20. the glass. He didn't mention that he actually has a glass of scotch in his hands. He had to have the scotch. With I the... can't believe this is almost 20 years ago now. I was going to say, you looked a lot younger there, Carl. But... Yeah, thanks, John. This was at the North Pole, literally at the North Pole in 2015. And this was at a wedding ceremony in Papua New Guinea in 2009. So just to reiterate you know, all things. So if we don't touch on what you're looking for here, then feel free to reach out and ask questions. And, and I'm happy to talk about because expedition raises a lot of questions, you know, where and when and what time of year and what gear and that sort of thing. So happy to chat with you about it. John talked about how many different destinations we visit. And we tried to capture it in this infographic here in 2019, because in 19, we've visited over 900 different ports of call around the world. The white ones represent, the white dots represent um, places that we would visit on the classic fleet. So the Caribbean, the Med, all up along the coast of, uh, of Europe, all of those white dots represent classic destinations. The red dots represent all the places that we visited with our expedition fleet. So from Antarctica to the Arctic, as John pointed out before, the Galapagos, Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, parts of Alaska, the Russian Far East, so across uh, the Bering from Alaska, uh, both coasts of Africa, both coasts of South America, literally all over the place. And this is how we do it. We've got this great little fleet of the smallest of the small vessels. John talked about our vessels ranging in guest capacity from 608 guests down to 100. It's the four smallest vessels in terms of guest capacity that are on the expedition side because we don't want to invade these places with a large group. So in this case, the Silver Explorer, 144 guests. 
in this case, our brand new silver origin, John referenced this as well, 100 guests, 50 suites only on this ship, which will operate exclusively in the Galapagos. So what's included? Everything, starting with your uh, economy class international flights to get you to the starting point of the voyage and, and to get you home again. If the flights are such that we require a pre-cruise night or a post-day room, those are included. Obviously, all suites, John talked about gratuities in every suite category, because some cruise lines are including the gratuities, but only when you're paying for the owner's suite and, and the next one down. We include gratuities throughout. Same with butler service and Wi-Fi. Some cruise lines are including those if you're in the top two or three categories of suites. We include it for everybody from the bottom to the top, Wi-Fi for everybody, butler service for everybody. Of course, wines and spirits and your in-suite bar all taken care of. And on expedition, everything is included. So all of the excursions, everything I'm gonna talk about when we get out of the ship, when we leave the ship and, and uh, cruise around by Zodiac, when we go sea kayaking, um, the hiking that we do on land in Antarctica or in the Galapagos or in the Arctic, that's all included. In the polar regions, we include a complimentary parka and it's yours to keep. So you don't have to go and buy cold weather gear just to go to Antarctica or the Arctic or Alaska. You arrive on the ship and this parka is waiting for you in your suite and it's yours to keep. We have an exclusive partnership with the Royal Geographical Society. That just means that occasionally we'll have members of the Royal Geographical Society come and join us. It also means that on the new Galapagos ship, there are some artifacts on loan from the Royal Geographical Society, including replicas of Darwin's sketches and Darwin's notebooks that are on display on that ship. And when we're snorkeling, we include all the snorkeling gear uh, that's free for you to use as well. So, the term expedition cruising, for those of us working in the travel industry, we know what it is, but not everybody does. So just quickly and, and with tongue firmly planted in cheek, this is not expedition cruising. And these folks are not on an expedition. Now there's nothing wrong with anything that I just showed you. Again, we're, we're owned by Royal Caribbean Group. And when folks are younger, when they have young families, when they have less vacation time, when they have less disposable income, the contemporary lines, the, the big ships are a great way to go. The ship is part of the destination. The ship has a zip line and a water slide and a go-kart track and all of those sorts of things. And the ship is part of the destination. That's part of the appeal and that's wonderful. As people get a little bit older and they're more established in their careers, they're making more money, they want to travel with fewer people. It's like migrating from economy class to business class. You go to business class because there's more space, the service is better, and there are fewer people up there. That's why we're doing this. And, you know, we think the fewer people is going to be a key element to people coming back to sailing again, because some people are going to be loath to go on to a, a ship that has 2,500 people or 4,000 or 5,000 or 6,000 people, at least in the early days when we start to get back. So we believe that they're really going to be enticed to come back to smaller ships and particularly smaller ships that are going to remote destinations. So what we do with expedition cruising is we take these small floating luxury hotels and John showed you the images of some of the suites and, and some of the co uh, common areas and some of the ships. They're absolutely beautiful. So they are like floating boutique hotels. And we take those ships to places that are really, really difficult if not impossible to get to on your own. And then we use the ship as a platform to debark and, and go and explore these places. So here we're exploring Central America with the Zodiacs. We're exploring in Antarctica with sea kayaks. Here we are in a remote beach in Iceland that we've approached by Zodiac from the ship. I mentioned the Russian Far East. So this is across the Bering from Alaska polar bear, or excuse me, uh, grizzly bears and volcanoes and just a lot of nature. You won't get a cell signal out here. You don't have to worry about it because you've got free Wi-Fi on the ship, but you won't find a t-shirt because there are no t-shirt shops. That's how far we, uh, how far out we are. And, and we are the infrastructure. So we have the Zodiacs, we have the kayaks. That would, that, those things are what make it possible to get off of the ship and to go and explore. Here we are in the Galapagos, hiking on a trail in Madagascar and arriving at a beach in Malaysian Borneo. 
So really, really remote spots. And we'll talk about three of them in a little more detail. So Antarctica, and we'll start with a little video. The white continent. This really feels like Earth's last frontier. It's so wild and remote here, but you instantly feel at peace. Everything is so vast, so pure, quiet. It's awe-inspiring. the whales, the ocean. This is a sanctuary we all have to treasure and preserve. Yep, it's an absolutely stunning, stunning place. I've had the distinct pleasure of having been four times to Antarctica. And when this is all over, it's the first place I would go back to in all seriousness. It's otherworldly. There's nothing else like it. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll visit a place and you'll come home and people will say, what was it like? Oh, it's like this, but without the palm trees, or it's like that, with, but without the crowds. You have some frame of reference. And in, in, in Antarctica, there is no other frame of reference. You can't compare it to the Arctic because the two are, are very, very dissimilar. And I'll explain why in a little bit. One of the questions we often get about expedition is, uh, I'm not sure I'm capable of that. Uh, you know, do I need to be a triathlete to do this? by no means, because this is a very typical landing in Antarctica, for example. So you can see it's quite flat ground. Sure, there's a bit of snow and ice there, but there the expedition team is meeting the Zodiacs. They will help you get off of the Zodiac and step foot on this gravelly beach. And now you're stepping foot on the seventh continent. And if this is as much activity as you want to do, if you just want to walk ashore and walk among the penguins and listen to the ornithologist talk about that, that's fine. That's as much activity as you need to do. You, Call is right. Yeah. You really can do as much as you want or as little as you want. I mean, take a look at me. I'm not exactly a uh, athlete at all. And I did, I haven't been to Antarctica, but I have done the Arctic and Galapagos. And, you know, they do give choices. Like I remember one day, one of the choices was to climb up the glacier or take, take the beach walk. And all I had to look at, I'm not gonna go climb all the way up there just to take a picture of all the way down here. I don't think so. I did the beach walk, but again, you have your choice. Yeah, this is this is the Arctic. That's what, that's what I did and uh, I not didn't do because I said, oh Lord have mercy. I don't think so. So I took, <laughs> I took a, I took the beach walk, but again, it's as much as you want to do or as little as you want to do. I did probably 90% of everything. Um, the, like this was one of the things I did, but I made a choice myself and there's a lot of choices to be had. You never know what it is. And some, like one of the times we decided that we were going to take uh, Zodiac cruise in the Galapagos versus the hike. And it was because it, the Zodiac cruise did sound a little more interesting, but we actually saw um, the penguins in the Galapagos on which they didn't expect us to see. So then everybody that did the hike was like, oh my God, you got to see that. And it was great, but it was like, you know, you never know what you're going to see. So just don't think, oh, choice A is the most active that's going to be the best. It's always not that way. Sometimes you'll see some amazing things when you do the thing that's not as active. Um, and I just have to point out that John needs a geography refresher because see the penguins up here, John? Oh, I'm sorry. It looked like the Arctic. Okay. <laughs> it reminded um, so to, me of the same glacier. Yeah, fair enough. Arctic. Fair enough. I'm just Pulling your leg. You're bust. So, to, I, to, I'll do the same to you. Don't worry. <laughs> you always do. To John's point, uh, yeah, it, this will all be explained the evening before. Tomorrow, we're going to head to such and such, and here are the excursion options. And, and, and again, I do have to feeling... point out one thing on this is that if you do decide you're going to do, let's say, that hike, and then halfway up the mountain, you're like, oh, I really can't do this. 
There's no one that's going to force you up. One of the guides will take you, walk with you back. So remember yeah. that you're never, it's, you're not in the army. You're like, if you change your mind halfway back, we're going to walk you right back. So again, yeah. a lot of options. So we've been, we, we, we disembarked the ship at eight o'clock. We've been out here on land for about an hour and a half or two hours um, doing a, a slower, more contemplative walk along the beach or doing something a little more strenuous. And then we're back on the beach, back into the Zodiacs to then go do Zodiac cruising for about two hours. So say from 10 until noon. And Zodiac cruising is a way to get a little bit closer to some of the wildlife. Of course, you're getting very close to the penguins. You saw in some of the images prior to that, that the gentleman photographing, for example, he was surrounded by penguins. You'll get very, very close to the penguins. But the seals, the whales, the leopard seals, penguins, when they're out of the water, that's where the Zodiac cruising comes in. And it's a really special part of the experience because you're just a few feet off the water. You know, typically when you're not on land, you're on the ship and you're four, five, six, seven decks up and looking down. And so you feel like you're at a significant dif distance away. You're in a Zodiac, you're a couple feet off the water and you're getting that, cl that much closer to the seals and the whales, and, and in some cases, the penguins when they're swimming and when they jump up on the chunks of ice. Um, even for photography of the glaciers and the icebergs, this perspective is really, really special. So that's a morning, two hours on land, two hours in the Zodiacs, back to the ship, we have lunch, the captain will navigate to a different bay or a different spot where there's a different species of penguin, and we do it all again in the afternoon, possibly in reverse order, so you head out at two, you might do your Zodiac cruising for two hours, and then around four, do a landing, come back to the ship around six, and then uh, grab a cocktail and meet up at seven for the recap and the briefing, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's also sea kayaking opportunities. And again, all of this stuff that John and I are talking about, those hikes, the Zodiac cruises, the kayaking, it's all included. You're not reaching into your pocket. You're not paying for extra shore excursions. This is all included. Uh, the sea kayaking, we always send out eight tandem kayaks. So 16 guests with two kayak guides. You can see the red kayaks there. Those are solo kayaks and the two guides. There's also a dedicated Zodiac that's exclusive for the use of the, of the, the folks kayaking. So that should somebody get cold or tired or they're not feeling well, they just raise their hand, the Zodiac takes them back. But the perspective here, you know, if you, if you go back to what we were saying about the Zodiacs, your perspective of being a few feet off the water, now you're arguably a couple inches or, or you're right at the water level. So the sights and the sounds and the smells are accentuated. You're just part of the experience. You're part of the surroundings. So it's really an amazing experience. So moving on to the Arctic and another video. While sailing on Silvice's first ever crossing of the Northeast Passage, I was struck by the incredible stillness of the Arctic Circle. We drifted calmly through pack ice as sunshine pierced the crisp Arctic air. From the top deck, we spotted two young polar bears in the distance. Time stood still, leaving me mesmerised as I witnessed these majestic animals exploring the frozen world of brilliant white ice and beautiful blue water. The polar bears captivated me entirely in their world of solitude, peacefulness and freedom. That video of those polar bears, that was a, a, a female and her year and a half old male cub. I just love it. And that was shot on our Northeast Passage Voyage. So it was a group of guests on the Silver Explorer that went from Alaska all the way over the top of Russia to Norway over the course of 25 or 26 days. And they saw polar bears on six different occasions. So pretty amazing. Uh, there's an onboard filmmaker. And at the end of every voyage, everyone gets a USB stick with a 12 to 15 minute film, a video that the, that the, the filmmaker made about your voyage. 
and that's where that uh, little snippet was taken from. So the Arctic, I mentioned how very, very different it is from Antarctica, and there are a couple of key points to, to uh, point out. One is Antarctica, there is a frozen landmass at the South Pole. The, Antarctica is a continent. The Arctic is a region, and, and the way some of us describe it is the Arctic is a frozen ocean surrounded by continents. Antarctica is a frozen continent surrounded by oceans. So very, very different because it means that we can access the Arctic from Alaska, from Canada, from Greenland, from Iceland, from Norway, not so much from Finland and Sweden, but also from Russia. So we can access it from a lot of different places. <clears throat> we can see a lot of, of different regions of the Arctic. And the other way that it's very, very different is in Antarctica, those images that you saw where there were lots of penguins, those are penguin colonies. And the penguins come back year after year after year and form their colony in the same place. They leave in March, they come back in October. And we know where they're going to be. So when we take our ship there and we go to ABC Bay in November, we know that we're going to find a colony of chinstrap penguins at ABC Bay because every year for the last 40 years, there's been a colony of chinstrap penguins at, a, uh, at ABC Bay during the season that we operate in Antarctica. So it's easy to find the wildlife is what I'm saying in Antarctica. In the Arctic, we're hopeful that we're gonna find things like beluga whales and narwhal, uh, walrus, reindeer, Arctic fox, polar bear, but they all come with their challenges in terms of finding them. The beluga and the narwhal travel around in groups, but they're strictly in the water. So we might see them if they surface. The walrus travel on uh, in, in the water, but they also haul out on land. And we know where their haul outs are, but we don't know when they're going to be at their haul outs. The reindeer are constantly grazing. The foxes are constantly hunting and the bears are constantly hunting. So going to, Ant to the Arctic is very much like going on safari. You're, it's, it, the zodiacs are like the Jeeps and we're zooming around looking for the wildlife. So if you've ever been to East Africa, if you've ever been to Southern Africa on safari, you know what I'm talking about. You wake up at 4.30 in the morning and you get in the Jeep or, or the, those open trucks to go looking for wildlife and you have no idea what you're going to see. You know what animals exist there and which ones you're hoping you're going to see, but you don't know if you're going to see a leopard kill or whether you're going to see a group of giraffes or you don't have, you have no idea. That's true of the Arctic as well. So it's a true expedition in that sense. And you have to go with a very, very open mind and a great sense of adventure. And we need a, a small ship with a very high ice class to go through waters like this to get into these areas where we know the wildlife sometimes hang out. And that's, you know, the small ship allows us to get in there, to get close, to then put the zodiacs in the water to get even closer to find the, nar or excuse me, the, the, the walrus, for example. And you know, speaking of the unknown, this might happen at one o'clock in the morning. This did happen at one o'clock in the morning. The guests had all gone to bed, but it's the kind of expedition where we're gonna wake you up. There's gonna be a PA announcement over, you know, an announcement over the PA at one o'clock in the morning saying uh, everything's fine. There's absolutely no emergency. Please put your red parkas on over your pajamas, put your boots on and come up to the observation deck because there's something we think you would like to see. And nobody complains that they were woken up to, to uh, see Northern Lights. Similarly, if we find polar bears, the naturalists and the marine biologists, they're gonna be up on the deck as soon as there's light with their spotting scopes and their binoculars. And if they spot bears, we'll direct the captain to try to get the ship relatively close. And then we'll wake everybody up, possibly at five, five thirty, six o'clock in the morning, call the kitchen and say, hold off on breakfast, but bring up some danishes and muffins and coffee and hot chocolate because we're gonna get the zodiacs in the water and we're gonna try and get the guests as close as we can to these bears. So again, real sense of adventure, a real sense of, of um, expedition. You've got to go with an open mind. Really so the last of, of the three destinations, sorry, John? No, no, what I was going to say is I've done Galapagos and it really is amazing because you'll never know what you're going to see each day because it's very different because they will change an itinerary at the drop of a hat. Oh, let's, we, we were going to go Zodiac cruising today but we spot, spotted polar bears. So we're gonna go over there and do that instead. But the because the wildlife is so different, you never know what you're gonna see. One of the stops one day, 
we were supposed to be doing Zodiac cruising, but instead they spent, uh, saw a whole pot of walruses that hauled out on a beach. And we went and we observed the walruses and we probably were within a hundred yards of these walruses, uh, closer than that, probably 50 yards. And it was amazing to watch them because each walrus, they all wanted to be next to each other, but they're all like moaning. They want an extra inch, but they don't want to, nobody wants to give much or basically move much. It really was amazing to watch them interact with themselves in their own environment. It was spectacular would be the way I would describe it. During that, during when we were watching the walruses, it probably was the fourth or fifth day of the cruise. And there was a, a kid there. When I say a kid, it was traveling with his parents and grandparents. And he was probably 20 years old. So we're not talking a kid, kid. And he turned to the grandfather and said, this is the most amazing thing I've ever done. Now, this is on the fifth day with no internet service because you're literally at the top of the world. And the internet service, this was about four years ago, was very lack because there's just no service up there because you literally, there's nobody living up there. But again, one of those things I will never forget. And this 20 year old saying that it was the most amazing thing he's ever done. I'll never forget that comment because I thought about it and I'm 50. 57 now but anyway but back then I was 50 and he said and I thought the same thing I said and you know but it's amazing because you never know what you're going to see and now Carl is going to take you to the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. Thanks Joe. Uh, so we'll start with the video again. Galapagos is unique because this is one of the few places on earth where you're actually accepted as part of the environment. These species are not running away or flying away in certain cases they're coming up to you and that makes this place truly unique. Something that surprises many people is the diversity of Galapagos. Not only the terrain, which is distinct from one island to the next, but also the diversity of life. But we have a unique diversity. In areas where you have reptiles such as sea turtles swimming next to penguins, there's nowhere else on Earth that you have that combination. Being a naturalist on the Silver Galapagos is not only fascinating for me because of this environment that we're traveling through, but also meeting our guests that are coming in here and seeing Galapagos through their eyes and the excitement of being able to interact with the species here. It's very personal. There's no other place like Galapagos on Earth. That is so true. No other place like Galapagos on Earth. It is like an, an open air zoo. It's like an open air living history museum. You're walking around. And, and you know, that was true in, in Antarctica. We were talking about walking amongst the penguins, but here in the Galapagos, it's just teeming with life. You're walking among sea lions. You're walking among blue-footed boobies. You're walking among um, uh, marine iguanas and Galapagos lizards. Lots and lots of different species. And they know no fear of us. They pose, we pose no threat to them. So we walk amongst them and it's, uh, again, it's, it's like being in this open air zoo and, and nobody's harming anybody. It's wonderful. We have two different itineraries. Uh, you can see on the map, they're, they're quite similar. We wanted to make sure that we took in the best islands, but on regardless of the itinerary, the, the main species that people wanna see in our experience, they're going to the Galapagos to see the giant tortoises, the blue-footed boobies, the sea lions, the marine iguanas, um, the frigate birds, the sea, uh, sea turtles, the Galapagos penguins, you'll see all of them on either one of these itineraries. So you're not making a bad choice by do doing one or the other. And if you really want to get specific, I'm sharing this chart, but we can go into detail if you've got further questions later. You can see that the average air temperature at the coolest time of year is 70 degrees and the average air temperature at the warmest time of year is 83. That's a difference of 13 degrees. That's not a whole lot. Um, and the average water temperature changes by seven degrees over the course of the year. So we're right at the equator, no huge big fluctuations. There is a warmer, slightly wetter time of year. There's a, a mist, like a light drizzle that falls in the evening. The islands are a little bit greener at this time of year, but it's a little warm and muggy to walk around. There's a drier, cooler period. You get more sun, but it is cool and it's cooler to go swimming or snorkeling. So you've got to make a decision based on that. If you have a window of opportunities, you, you have no choice in when you can go. This is the only time or we're taking the kids and the only time we can go is in July and August. 
great. We've got other charts that we can share with Tammy's Journeys and, and go into detail about what's happening on the islands in July and August. What are the different species doing at different times of year on the different islands? And, and help put your mind at ease that you're not making a bad choice. There is no bad time if you're to go. There are just different times of year, different things happening. Something unique in the Galapagos is that all of the naturalists, I referred to glaciologists and ornithologists, and marine biologists and historians and what have you, um, both for Antarctica and the Arctic, and they might be from anywhere in the world. They could be American, Canadian, South African, German, you name it. Everything conducted in English. Here in the Galapagos, they all have to be permanent residents of the Galapagos. So who better to show you the Galapagos than these folks because it's their backyard and they love showing off the Galapagos and it's amazing. And each one of them will have a specialty, an ornithologist, a botanist, a volcanologist to speak to the volcanic nature of the islands, a, hist a historian or um, um, anthropologist to talk about human interaction or humans on the Galapagos for the last couple hundred years. So they're absolutely fascinating. They each deliver a formal lecture every day. This is the least formal of our voyages. So we talk about being a luxury cruise line. Of course, there are opportunities for the captain's dinner, for example, or the captain's welcome cocktail. For those who want to get dressed up, who those, those who want to take a suit or a tuxedo or a gown, there are opportunities to do that. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. And I, I, will, uh, I, will, I will have to interrupt Carl there. I can tell you I've done two of these now, and 95% of the people don't do that. <laughs> so, but there's always a couple that will do it. But 95% of the people are basically in dockers and a button down shirt basically yep. is. So if you do want to go to the main dining room and it happens to be a formal night, uh, again, particularly on expedition, you do not have to go in formal wear. Country club casual is fine, dockers and a polo shirt. Um, and there's always a, a second option for dining. In some cases, there are three or four or, or five options for dining. Um, in, in the Galapagos, there's the main dining room, but there's also a grill. And it's on cooler evenings, it can be enclosed. So you could still stay in your shorts and your sandals and your t-shirts all day. So we go ashore and those naturalists that I mentioned, they're the ones who are interpreting as we go along. They're bringing it to life. They're talking about all the animals and all the, the flora that we're seeing. They're talking about the history of that island. And again, bringing everything to life. You know, I, I referenced going on safari in Africa. It's a little bit similar, except you're on foot. You're doing everything on foot and, and they are interpreting as you go along and talking about the species that you see. Here too, we offer sea kayaking. Again, it's complimentary. We take you out with uh, kayak guides. The perspective is phenomenal because again, you're just a couple inches off the water. So a beautiful way to see the Galapagos. And snorkeling, we provide all the snorkeling gear, mask, fins, snorkel, wetsuit. Um, all of that is provided for you. And I believe on both itineraries, there are five different opportunities to go snorkeling. So plenty of time, uh, plenty of opportunities, plenty of different chances to go snorkeling and, and the snorkeling is phenomenal. Again, because of the wildlife, the sea lions know no fear of us and they'll come right up to you, especially the young ones. They're, they're like puppies, they're called pups. And uh, they may tug on your uh, fins or they may swim right up to your mask and then dart away at the last second. They're so agile in the water. It's, it's it, it truly is amazing because when I was in the Galapagos, I did that. And I'll never forget this baby uh, sea lion came up to my mask and I'm like, I know mama's got to be around here somewhere as I'm trying to pedal backwards. And there's all, <laughs> you know, so you could like, oh, wait a minute. So anyway, but there's all different levels. Like some of the um, snorkeling, you'll be able to go directly from the beach. And then we have advanced ones that would actually be from um, going off the uh, Zodiac directly. As a matter of fact, during our cruise, we met an older lady who was probably early 80s and she went on one of the advanced, and they tell you it's for advanced swimmers. Anyway, and she went and she said, oh my God, I, she said, I thought I was gonna kill myself swimming. I said, why didn't you raise your hand? Because the Zodiacs are right there. If you feel you need help, they'll come get you and pull it, you know, and put you right in the Zodiac. She said, I didn't want to admit that my friends were right that told me I was too old to do it. <laughs> but she said they were right. <laughs> the other thing about Galapagos, but all of these destinations that we've talked about, they're amazing for kids. This is my son, Alex, when he was five. 
and we went to the Galapagos in July of 18. So coming up on three years ago now, and he had an absolute blast. And 97% of the Galapagos is undeveloped. So where we arrive at these beaches and these boardwalks and these places where we're gonna go and explore, there are no towns. So there are no roads and cars and buses. There are no yacht clubs and marinas. So there are no jet skis and motorboats going back and forth. So when we arrive there, it's just us and it's just a beach and it's just a couple of trails, sometimes a boardwalk. So from a parent's perspective or a grandparent's perspective, you're not concerned about the well-being of the child from, from that perspective, from other human interaction. The animals don't want to bite us. We're not food to them and they're not afraid of us. So it's an amazing place to take kids. And we're seeing a lot of family groups. We're seeing a lot of multi-generational families. So the grandparents, the middle generation and the grandchildren whether it's Antarctica, the Arctic, Galapagos. Galapagos would probably the, be the one where most people start. Uh, everyone's heard of the Galapagos. Kids love animals. Kids love the naturalists and they love talking to the guides about everything. So it's it's really a fantastic destination for kids and, and for multi-generational families. The new ship, the Silver Origin. I just thought I'd talk a little bit about that and show you not just this ship, but it'll give you a sense of, of the caliber of our ships across the fleet. She was delivered in July of last year. She has never sailed with guests. She's off the coast of Ecuador right now in Manta, and we think we may start sailing in the Galapagos as early as July. We'll have to see how things go with the Ecuadorian government and the Galapagos authorities, but we're hopeful that we can start sooner than later. This is the interior of the new ship. This is an area called uh, Base Camp. I mentioned the partnership we have with the Royal Geographical Society and artifacts and what have you. So there are all kinds of things on loan here. So it, it's like a museum. So even when you're on the ship, you're not hiking around in the Galapagos, you're not in the Zodiac, you're not uh, kayaking, you're on board the ship you're exploring and learning about the Galapagos. This is the Explorer Lounge. Every one of the expedition ships has this. And I mentioned the recap and the briefing before, and this is true of every expedition. So in this case, in the Galapagos, again, we'd come back to the ship around 6, 6.30. You freshen up, you grab a cocktail, you come to this Explorer's Lounge, and the expedition team are there to talk about the day, the recap, what did we do today and where did we go and what did we see? Here are the names of the species we saw for those of you keeping a list. And the briefing, the other half of this meeting, where are we going tomorrow and what are we going to do? And John touched on this. Here is a list of the excursions for tomorrow. And what they did in the Galapagos is they've taken a video of the most strenuous part of the most strenuous hike that's being offered the next day. And they show you about 30 seconds or a minute of that video to give it some context. So we're offering three hikes tomorrow at ABC. Um, we're offering deep water snorkeling, we're offering beach snorkeling, and we're offering kayaking. Uh, yeah, kayaking. Of the three hikes, here's a one minute video of the most strenuous part of the most strenuous hike. And then you can decide based on that. So that's the Explorer Lounge. This is not the entry level suite, but it's the next one up. Um, so to give you a sense of the size and the space and, and just how open and bright it is, this is what we're calling an infinity window or infinity balcony. This huge piece of glass slides down and essentially gives you a balcony and a veranda. You can close these curtains here and have it really seem like a separate balcony. Or if you want, open it up, get the ocean breeze, and it just gives your suite a, a greater sense of, of size. And this is the Royal Suite. So going to the other end, not, this isn't even the owners, this is close to the owners. You've got a quarter of the aft of the ship as your deck. So a huge deck space. It's like a small apartment. It's a really, really lovely suite. And the largest suite on the ship, the owners I think is almost 1900 square feet. I think it's 1881 square feet. If you'd like to read some more and see some gorgeous images, there's no sales pitch here. This is our blog, discover.silversea.com. We've hired writers and we've hired photographers to go to many of these destinations and just write about their experience. So some great pieces there. All the videos that we showed you today, they're all available on our YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com, look up Silver Sea Cruises, we have our own channel and all the videos we showed you today and many, many, many more to get your juices flowing, to whet your appetite so that you can then call your travel advisor and say, wow, I just saw something on Greenland that blew my mind. And I'll hand it back to you, John.
Well, thank you. Um, and we do have some great offers for you. Um, we've extended up, we have up to 20% savings with early booking bonus, payment bonus, um, reduced deposit to 50, 15%. Um, also through Tammy's, um, if you book anything within the next 14 days, you will receive a $250 per person savings as well as a VIP from me. And what the VIP does, it gives you some nice amenities on board, but the biggest amenity is laundry. So basically you'd have free laundry for the um, duration of the cruise. Could you go ahead? Um, single supplements. Now this, we are very single friendly cruise line. We are probably the most single friendly cruise line you will ever see. We have a lot of single supplements beginning as low as 110%, 125%. And we're also single friendly when because of the size, because we're not a big ship. So th what that means to you is, is that you know, you get lost in crowds. We never have a crowd on board. So you're extremely well taken care of when you're single. Um, there's always a singles get together every evening on the ships as well. Um, there'll be a singles cocktail party. And if you would like to dine with other singles or other people, we'll arrange that for you. So you'll never have to dine by yourself unless that's by choice. If you do that, if you choose that, that's fine with us as well. Um, and I will tell you, one thing is when you do find these um, single supplements, usually you find a lot more singles on board. I went to the Galapagos, which is a small ship to begin with. It only holds 100 people. But we did have a low single supplement on that. And there was about 15 singles on it. Now, if you think about it, at that point, because that would be 30, they represented 30% of the guests on board at that point. They had a single, the singles cocktail party became the ship's cocktail party every night because they were such fun people. Everybody gravitated towards this. So usually, again, the ship wasn't full. I think it had about 70 people on it, but we all gravitated to the single cocktail party and there'd be 50 people at the single cocktail party, but only 15 of them were single. So again, when, when you see these single supplements lower, it usually encourages the singles to go. Go ahead, Carl. Um, cruise with confidence. Again, you can cancel up to 30 days um, prior to departure for any sailing um, that you are booking now through the middle of 2022. Um, where you will get a full future cruise credit back for canceling up to 30 days prior to sailing. With that, Tammy is actually hosting one of our cruises in um, September that she's gonna be the signature host on. So I'm gonna ask Tammy now to talk a little bit about that. Tammy? Can you hear me? Yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I just had to unmute myself. Let me see what I look like now too. So I'll- um, Well, your picture in. is there, so don't worry about it. You don't, if you wanna show a video, you can, but if you don't- Oh, start a video. Okay. Oh, there I am. I got San Francisco behind me, where my son lives. <laughs> um, yeah, from Coit Tower, looking down and I always, when everybody comes to my office, I always point um, where the, where my son lives. Um, it's right, He he's like five steps from Lombard Street and he took me up all the way up and I was never the same after that from that trip so mm. uh, but anyway he, he and he's only maybe less than five minute walk from Fisherman's Wharf so he lives in a really good area but I'm excited to say that I will be hosting the uh, Greek Isles trip on the 16th of September uh, for those of you the reason I chose this trip to host is I'll be turning 60 um, at the end of the trip. So I wanted to do something fun for my 60th birthday. And so that's the reason why, and I've been to the Greek Isles before and this, the reason I picked this itinerary, I love the Greek Isles, so I wanted to go back, but this particular itinerary is great because it actually goes to Rhodes and Crete as well as Ephesus and then Mykonos and Santorini. So one of the reasons why I love the Silver Sea and I love the Greek Isles trip and I always focus on where it's going because of the fact that there's not a lot of cruise lines, believe it or not, that will go to both Santorini and Mykonos. So that's the reason why I think one year Silver Sea didn't even had maybe one sailing the whole year that went to both. But 
So I always focus on that. So that's the other reason, because I always want people to see and experience both Mykonos and Santorini, because they're both a little bit different, but you want to go to, I always say you want to go, we want to see both. And then Ephesus, of course, speaks for itself. And also, I've never been to Crete or I've never been to Rhodes. So that's another reason why this particular cruise was so appealing to me. So there are, and I saw that a, there is a Vista Suite that just opened up. It looked like um, or Vista Suite guarantee. So those that are not concerned about having a veranda, um, there's an opportunity to book into a Vista Suite, which is, I think, the lowest category that Silver Sea has. Um, and let's put it this way. That's the category that I always go in there because talking about singles, I've been on Silver Sea um, twice by myself and I never felt alone. And that's um, so true about what you had said. I didn't even go to the singles parties, but it seems like that when they see you kind of like sitting there by yourself that, you know, you always meet people that'll, oh, come join us or whatever. So, and then the other thing too, is being a signature host, um, I'm usually trying to dine with all the signature guests, whether they want to dine by themselves. I'll usually ask them, hey, is there a particular time that, you know, you'd like to have me join you or whatever, or um, Hot Rocks. Is Hot Rocks on this on the moon? Yes, it is. Okay. I love Hot Rocks. It's my, oh, it, it's Hot like Rocks is things. such a fun, Hot Rock Rocks. And so <laughs> that's usually the, that's usually the group dinner that I always have. Everybody get together. Um, well, because you get to choose your food that you want, your chicken, your fish, or your steak, and you have these hot rocks, lava rocks, and you cook them on your own. And I don't know, we get so chatty sometimes that um, I usually have to have somebody help me cook because I might burn something because we're having so much fun drinking <laughs> and socializing. Drink. Yeah, I do. The waiter will always cook it cooking. for you if you don't want to do it. So, oh, but I know. But hot rocks is like so much fun. To you know, do, I love, and a, lot of, a lot of the clients always, end up trying to book that a second time. I'll put it to you this way: When I went to the Arctic, there is a hot rocks on the Silver Explorer. The grill is becomes hot rocks a night. Now it was cold, and literally we sat out there with, with our parkers because we were having such a good time. The ice, the glass, actually, the, there was a thin layer of ice on top of the glass because it froze because it was so <laughs> cold. But we were having such a good time. We we're like. Big deal. We'll stay out there, you know. Yeah. Well, it, on the Greek Isles trip, the last time I did, well, yeah, it was last year. It was a little cool because I went in um, April, and it was a little cooler then. But they bring out those uh, heat lamps, so you're never cold. Um, and blankets out there. They do have blankets. and blank and blankets. Oh yeah. But in September, so, you won't have to worry about it. It will be warm. It will still be warm. Right. And that's the other reason why I picked September as well as that it's just a different, it's a warmer season than April. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that that trip that I took in April back in, I think is 2017, I believe that was the only one that had Mykonos and Santorini um, that year. So that, again, that's the reason why I always, when I go to the Greek Isles and I, I'm, I may go again, um, but it's just the fact that I just like the fact that that itinerary always goes to the islands that everybody thinks about Greece and when they go to the Greek Isles this is where they want to go so that's kind of what I focus on however the other fabulous um, ports of call that that Greece itinerary does so it does islands that you don't typically see like I went to Limon one year and that was that's a small that has more Mediterranean feel um, uh, to it but um, some of the islands that you guys pick are fabulous because they're off the beaten path that you don't normally I, go to on yeah. regular. Again, that's the, because of the size of the ships, we're able to do that. So again, it really does help when the ship is small because you can get into places. You can go to places that normally are not cruise ship places. You know, um, I mean, I went to, I've been to places where literally in, in the Mediterranean, these quaint little towns, and you're like, oh my God, there's not even a t-shirt shop here. It's amazing because you're like, it's so, so off the beaten path, but the ships are small enough to do that. So, right. you know, 
So with that being said, I want to thank everybody attending. If there's any questions, feel free to um, ask now. There were none in the chat box. So if anyone wants to type any question or if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box or we can certainly unmute. Or we'll just unmute everybody if anybody has any questions. If not, don't worry about it. <laughs> but again, if you do book anything in the next 14 days, you will receive an additional 250 per person savings off of whatever you book through Tammy. And I will tell you this, we are, as I mentioned in the beginning, selling um, very well. Um, the prices will only go up. We do have dynamic pricing. I really don't see any pricing going down. And this is through the cruise industry and probably through the travel industry as a whole. There is such a pent up demand. You know, I, I was asked that, you know, when do you think I could take a cruise with a quote unquote bargain price? And it wasn't even on Silver Sea. It was on, on a mass market line. I said, probably not until 2024 will you see you know, when they have those quote unquote fire sales because the, the demand is there right now. Okay, I've and if there's no- to as re revenge tourism. Revenge people, tourism. people weren't able to go anywhere in 20 and they didn't spend any money and they're likely not gonna go anywhere in 21, at least likely not till the end, mm -hmm. nor spend any money that when they do go back, they're going back with a vengeance. Yes. So with that, thank you again for joining and, uh, Look forward to seeing you on board soon. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Bye. Thank you, Tammy. Bye. Bye, everyone.